Our next keynote speaker has come to us all the way from the United Kingdom. Anne Fordham is the Executive Director of the International Drug Policy Consortium, or the IDPC, and is responsible for calling for reform of laws and policies that have failed to address global illegal drug supply. She has a Master in Human Rights and extensive experience uh, in HIV AIDS prevention. To talk about global reform post UNGAS 2016, please welcome Anne Fordham. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, and really thank you, Ross, and to the New Zealand Drug Foundation for this invitation to be here and address you today. It's a real honor. Um, uh, it is also my first time to New Zealand, so it's really wonderful to be here. I've been wanting to come for a long time, so I feel very privileged. And also to, to listen to the discussion thus far today, which I think is a, a very sophisticated and mature debate. And I think, you know, I feel hopeful for New Zealand that you're, you're having these conversations that reform will be possible here. Um, I did want to note that every speaker so far this morning, every formal speaker, in addition to being a woman, is also called either Anne or Alison. <laughs> um, and I didn't want to break that trend, but um, I do think someone needs to talk to Ross Bell about diversity issues. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, I want to say I've known Ross for many years. Um, in full disclosure, he's actually the chair of the board of the International Drug Policy Consortium. And outside of that important role, um, Ross and I also work together a great deal at the global level, um, particularly around the UN debates, um, and particularly around ensuring the voices of civil society and affected communities, uh, and, or, and from many diverse perspectives, are brought to bear on that international debate. So, and today, I've been asked to talk about that international debate, um, briefly where we've come from, where we are now, what the opportunities are, and of course, some of the challenges as well. The first question might be, however, why do we care about international drug policy in the first place? It can seem pretty abstract and far away when you're focused at the national or even the local level. But the reality is that drug control policies are highly centralized, and the international regime, which is based on three UN conventions, which I'll discuss briefly in a moment, exerts a great deal of normative pressure on national and regional drug policies. And also, to some extent, we also would say the reverse is true. What happens at the national level in terms of progressive policies will also exert pressure on the international level and the international debate. Um, until now, and I think, you know, we've talked a bit about the human rights dimension, I will, I will talk about that a lot more. Um, but narrow interpretations of these three UN conventions have been presented by, previously, by UN drug control bodies and also by certain governments who are opposed to reform to justify continuing repressive measures and to stifle progress on reform, including previously on harm reduction and on the issue of decriminalization, and more recently has been focused on the legal regulation of cannabis. But over the years, we've seen that sustained advocacy from civil society actors from all over the world has been crucial in shifting the global rhetoric towards upholding human rights, ensuring the centra centrality of public health, and as well as promoting just and proportionate criminal justice responses. Um, so last year was the third ever UN General Assembly special session on drugs, or as Alison just mentioned, the UNGAS, which actually sounds like some kind of anti-flatulence medication. That's how you can remember it. Um, but it took place in New York, and the process um, for the UNGAS and the outcome of the UNGAS, which is sort of like a political declaration, we call it the outcome document, is an important bellwether for assessing where the international debate is at, so I will also talk about that um, and talk about how the young gas shifted the needle, pardon the pun, towards a more progressive paradigm and created opportunities and momentum which, you know, we as civil society advocates but also progressive and forward-looking governments must now capitalise on. <clears throat> 
I have slides. Haha. Um, so before I begin, just quickly to, to introduce the IDPC, some of you may be familiar with us, but those of you who are not, we're a global network of actually 176 um, NGOs and other networks, including networks of people who use drugs from over 60 countries from around the world. And IDPC members come together to promote open and objective debate in drug policy, but obviously we have an agenda, and our agenda is that drug policy should be grounded in the principles of human rights and public health. And IDPC's mandate is really to ensure that civil society voices are heard in drug policy making forums, particularly at the UN level, but also at the national level where our small secretariat staff supports our members to, to open up the national debates as well. So yeah, we have a modest secretariat in London, where I'm based, but also a sm very small regional office in Bangkok to support our members in, in Asia. And I'll talk a bit more later as well about how Asia is one of the regions with some of the most repressive drug policies in the world. So just briefly, the structure of my presentation. Um, I will do a very quick recap of the UN conventions and the flexibility within them because I think it's important to be aware of them. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to bore you with loads of detail on that. Um, we'll also talk about, I think, again, it's worth, um, you know, <laughs> reiterating the consequences of this very punitive approach that has been taken globally to the drugs issue. Um, you know, we talk about them a lot, but these issues are still very pertinent and very important as, you know, the basis for driving change and reform, things have to change. Um, the fractured consensus um, that, you know, governments are shifting. I mean, Alison Ritter talked about that this morning. There are po there's a lot of policy divergence on the drugs issue, and I'll kind of take it region by region for that. And then sort of after the young gas, what, what happened at the young gas? What are the outcomes and what are the opportunities? So very briefly, and I hope you don't fall asleep during this bit, but um, the, the foundation of the international drug control system are the three conventions, the 1961, the 1971, and the 1988. The first two treaties brought together under international control many substances that were previously used le legally for recreational use, um, like heroin, and you can see here the over-the-counter branded bottle. Um, previously, you could buy it in pharmacies and also substances that were traditionally used in many science societies around the world for medicinal, cultural, or religious purposes. And you see there a lady smoking an opium pipe. The conventions have two goals. The first is to limit the supply and demand for substances under international control to medical and scientific use, thereby outlawing the recreational use of drugs. And the second goal, which we actually haven't really discussed much today, was to ensure the availability of these controlled substances for, for these uses, for medical and scientific use. For example, for the relief of pain and suffering. And it's quite important to remember this second goal because the focus has been overwhelmingly on achieving the first goal through repressive and punitive means at the expense of ensuring availability for the medical use of substances. So access to controlled drugs such as opiates, while you know, prolific in, say, North America, um, you know, there are many parts of the world where we have a pain epidemic going on, where people cannot access these opiates for the relief of pain and suffering and for palliative care. And it's people based in developing countries who have the lowest access to those drugs because of over strict overly strict regulations on drugs like morphine. So end-stage can cancer patients, um, you know, women in childbirth, I mean, people who really need these drugs are unable to access them and, and, and suffer in um, a lot of pain. These conventions, the three treaties, have almost universal support, and there's actually been a great deal of pride in what's known as the Vienna Consensus. So the idea that the whole global community all agrees exactly on how to respond to the issue of drugs, and that response is based on repression through criminal justice means. Um, so the, there is a preamble in the 1961 convention that the drug control regime is about protecting the health and welfare of mankind. But that's become rather empty when you consider the devastating um, effects of the war on drugs. 
approach, which I think you know, these conventions have largely underpinned. However, and I'll talk a bit more about this too, they contain significant flexibility, these treaties, not without limits, however, for governments to take far less pragmatic and, and far less draconian measures. And these include, for example, harm reduction programs and, yes, the removal of criminal sanctions for drug use and possession for personal use, a policy option that is increasingly pursued by many governments. So the latitude, this flexibility I mentioned, that is within the treaties has been a subject of much debate. Um, countries have sought to explore the fullest extent of what is permissible under the treaties to implement these more pragmatic and less repressive approaches. And in the past, it was the issue of harm reduction. It was hotly contested. Um, there was a lot of resistance from the U at the UN level and also in particular from a body called the International Narcotics Control Board, the INCB. This is the so-called treaty guardians who monitor compliance with these treaties. They used to say that harm reduction was not permissible under the treaties because harm reduction measures encouraged drug use. But over time, governments simply continue to implement harm reduction measures, particularly in Europe, for example. Um, and I think also in Australia and New Zealand, and have pushed back and made strong legal arguments in support of harm reduction. And the INCB has softened over time, and finally this year, and this is an important breakthrough, has admitted that the use of drug consumption rooms, some safe injection facilities, within certain caveats is permissible. And that is a really important step forward because that was always an area that was strongly contested around the use of drug consumption rooms and it was also you know the, the use of con drug consumption rooms has always been seen as one of the final frontiers in in harm reduction on cannabis i think governments have been pushing the limits for a very long time um, previously stopping short of legal regulation using loopholes around personal use to allow measures like the dutch coffee shop system i mean Despite what people may think, drug use is still not legal under Dutch law. And the Dutch used an argument around personal use to allow the coffee shop system. But now they have an issue around what they call the back door because the coffee shop systems, the coffee shops in, in the Netherlands are supplied from the illicit market. So from illicit growers. And that's created a problem of its own. So that's an issue they're trying to address now. Obviously, we've talked a lot about medical marijuana already today and the idea of cannabis social clubs. So when people come together to use their personal use allowance of cannabis to grow together in cooperatives. And we've seen this a lot in countries like Spain and also under the legal regulation system in Uruguay, the cannabis social club system is very much thriving. So the leeway for decriminalization, um, it's long been established, in fact, um, there is a caveat in the 1988 convention, I'm not going to read it out, but essentially it allows for governments to not enact criminal offences for personal use um, as so far as it's subject to the constitutional principles around the basic um, concepts of a national legal system. So this is the argument that this exception for personal consumption has provided the legal basis for decriminalization schemes in Portugal, um, as I mentioned, the Dutch coffee shop system, and also the cultivation of cannabis for personal use. So the, the drug control treaties do not require governments to criminalize use and possession and cultivation for personal use. However, that's where the limit is. In terms of um, legal regulation and the treaties, it is outside the scope of the treaties. Um, many legal scholars have looked at this and that is their conclusion. Um, some have argued that medical and scientific could extend to legal regulation schemes, but I find that problematic because the whole thrust of the treaties was to limit recreational use. Um, however, that's not to say that governments should not go ahead with legal regulation, particularly the governments who are moving forward with cannabis, and acknowledge this limit, take what we're calling a stand of principled non-compliance. It's almost like civil disobedience, if you will, to say that, of course, you know, they are in violation of the treaties, but they're trying to protect the health and welfare of their citizens. There's a human rights dimension to this around not criminalizing young people for cannabis use. 
Um, and I think that that's an important um, step that needs to be made, even though it's you know, in breach of the treaties as they currently stand. There are other options. Governments looking to regulate cannabis could withdraw from the 1961 convention where cannabis is scheduled, re-exceed with a reservation on cannabis. Um, Bolivia did this on the coca leaf. I'll mention that a little later as well. There's also this idea within the Vienna Law of Treaties that governments could do something called modifications inter se. That's me that means to at least two parties to the treaties, two governments could agree between them that they um, will legalize cannabis use in, you know, in violation of the treaties. But say, for example, if the Netherlands chose to do this and wanted to import hashish from Morocco, the Netherlands and Morocco could have an agreement between them that's outside of the treaty regime. And there is also an upcoming opportunity on cannabis. Cannabis, believe it or not, has never been scientifically reviewed by the World Health Organization. Um, the World Health Organization's expert committee on drug dependence has the task of reviewing different substances and deciding whether they should be scheduled at the international level and under what schedule they should sit. Um, so the cannabis currently sits in the same schedule of the 1961 convention as heroin and cocaine. It was actually last reviewed in 1935 under the League of Nations administered system of the interwar period. This review, unfortunately, was based primarily upon morality and racial and cultural stereotypes of cannabis users, but yet that classification remains today. And this is despite the far-reaching scientific and social shifts that have occurred in the intervening decades, almost a century. Um, and the pressure now, obviously, is there's an increasing number of jurisdictions allowing cannabis use and now for recreational use. And this genuinely poses a powerful challenge to the international system. So, there, so the WHO has agreed to conduct a pre-review. That just happened at the end of last year and they will do this pre-review early 2018, and then hopefully move to the next stage, they do a pre-review and then a critical review. So that is important vis-a-vis -vis cannabis. So moving on, I, I mean, I actually will not spend too long on this section, but around the consequences of the war on drugs or these punitive approaches. I just wanted to show this quote. This quote comes from a paper actually from the UN Office of Drugs and Crime that was written by its then executive director, Antonio Maria Costa in 2008, where it was, I think, one of the first real um, official formal admissions at that kind of UN level that things might, work, might not be working as they should vis-a-vis -vis international drug control and that there were a number of what they called negative unintended consequences. Um, actually, he, and this was a paper written at the, f at the end of the first UNGAS decade. So the previous UNGAS before the 2016 one was in 1998. Um, just to reflect on that for a moment, the slogan for the 1998 UNGAS, the official UN slogan was, a drug-free world, we can do it. Yep. Yeah. So, um, but Antonio Maria Costa listed five um, unintended consequences. The first was the criminal black market, which I think current estimates put at at least 600 billion US dollars per year. But I think that's possibly even a modest estimate in terms of the drugs market. Um, what he called policy displacement, and we've talked about that a bit today. So public health being completely displaced in terms of law enforcement priorities, and that also is relevant in terms of, very relevant in terms of resource displacement, right? Governments have a limited amount of money, and most of them tend to spend, as we've discussed here as well, the figures in New Zealand, they tend to spend an overwhelming proportion of their drug control budget on enforcement rather than on treatment and on health and on harm reduction. The third one was geographical displacement. So this is what's also known as the balloon effect, that you will suppress the production of drugs in one area, and we've seen this with opium, for example, but it simply will pop up in another area because the basic laws of economics is that supply will meet demand. The fourth one was substance displacement. 
And I think the best example of this is, you know, trying to suppress the use of some substances simply displaces the market. Users move to other substances. And I think the rise of new psychoactive substances is related directly to this problem. And for me, you know, has led to ever-increasing harm. So, for example, the issue of synthetic cannabinoids, spice. You know, we have a big problem with spice in the UK. I think perhaps it's also been a problem here in New Zealand. Um, actually would be much safer for people to be able to access good quality, um, reliable source of real cannabis than be smoking synthetic cannabis. So that was the fourth one. And the fifth one was the marginalization of users, which has been very damaging for millions of people all over the world, you know, resulting in their criminalization and undermining their health in terms of how they've been marginalized. So this came from the UN. This this, this paper was, is you know, nearly 10 years old, and unfortunately, I think it's still really relevant because we're still, the paradigm is shifting, but not maybe as quick as some of us would like. So I just put this slide up there. I'm, again, not going to read them out, but you know, there has been many devastating consequences from this approach from a public health perspective and a human rights perspective. Um, and, you know, I mean, just for example, with the HIV AIDS issue. There was a UN target um, set in 2011 to reduce the number of new HIV infections amongst people who inject drugs by 50% by 2015. And in fact, UNAIDS released data at the end of last year that showed that between 2011 and 2015, the numbers of new infections amongst people who inject drugs globally increased by 33%. And that is a question of political will because we know that needle and syringe programs, opiate substitution therapy will reduce new HIV infections amongst people who are injecting. But there's just not the resources there and there's still ideological opposition to, to harm reduction. I also got sent this graph recently and I just thought it was really amazing. I mean it does show it was really depressing, actually, but it's, it really encapsulates what's, what's happened in terms of the, the drug war. Um, and it's only the US, um, and I'm actually trying to find a way to put some data together to make this graph into a global graph. But I don't know if it would be even as dramatic as the US. But it is pretty dramatic, and I think it is indica indicative of global trends where you look at what happened when the war on the escalation of the war on drugs with what happened with the US prison population. So there, just in 1980, just before I think it was Ronald Reagan officially declared the war on drugs, you had about 10% of the US prison population, which was, you know, a quarter of what it is now, being incarcerated for drug offenses. And then that prison population has quadrupled and the numbers of people incarcerated for drug offences is now 25% of the total prison population. So it just gives you, and it just, you know, increasing escalation as different things um, happened around um, US, you know, policy, essentially. And it is, you know, in, uh, the Penal Reform International actually d did a very good report in 2015 that, that, and their data showed that one in five people sentenced to prison globally is for a drug offense. And of those people in prison for drug offenses, 80% are there for possession alone. Not, not for trading, not for supply offenses, they're, they're there for possession alone. So who are we putting in our prisons? And also there's a high level of disproportionality around sentencing for drug offenses. In many countries, um, drug crimes attract higher sentences than aggravated assault, than rape, and then and murder, and this is true in Southeast Asia and also across Latin America. I mean, it's incredibly, a very disproportionate regime. And we've talked a bit about the racial dimension and the socioeconomic dimension of this issue as well. So those are the people who we're incarcerating, people who are poor, people who are vulnerable, and people who are already, already marginalized. And pertinent to this conference, women are the fastest growing prison population in many parts of the world. And this is also driven by convictions for low-level, non-violent drug offenses. So given all of this background and all the problems, which I think many of you are well versed in, I think the important thing is that some of this evidence and this 
damage and the failure of this approach is being brought to bear on the international debate. And I mentioned earlier the Vienna consensus, um, if it ever really existed, um, is definitely fracturing and has been fracturing for a very long time. Um, you know, in terms of whether punitive prohibition is the answer to stemming the or eradicating the drug trade. So there is, you know, there has been in, an increasing trend for over a long time of this de-escalation from, from the war on drugs. Um, I mentioned earlier the International Narcotics Control Board, previously kind of the attack dog of punitive prohibition. Well, they've kind of done a 180. I mean, they really, and I, again, it's civil society pressure that's, that's done this, but the INCB is now generally a voice of reform, and that is amazing. You know, they're very strong on the need to end the death penalty. They're very concerned around this issue of disproportionate sentences. Um, they're pushing alternatives to incarceration. I think that's, you know, a real win for the reform debate, to have the INCB basically on the side of pushing for reform. But I think it's also fair to say, and again, we've discussed this earlier, that there is no silver bullet. It's, it's what in policy circles is called a wicked issue. There are, there are definitely better answers, um, and I think, you know, it's important that governments try to find those answers, but the idea that they will eradicate the drug trade, um, I think is absolutely a pipe dream and their priorities and goals really need to shift. So briefly, just to look at some of the regional developments over the years. Um, I don't know if you can see this very well, but you can, you'll get the idea. Basically, this is Europe. Um, Europe has generally avoided the sharpest and most repressive um, aspects of the war on drugs, so around militarization. They've also been very resistant to support to um, the idea of aerial spraying of drug crops in forced eradication efforts. Um, we don't have issues around mass incarceration for drug offenses in, in Europe, in Western Europe anyway. And they've also been very vocal against the use of the death penalty. And they've led the way on harm reduction. So this is um, data from the um, European Monitoring Center on drugs. And 1998, you can see there, harm reduction programs, this is NSP and OST, was quite patchy. And of course, coverage, you know, two decades later is, is, is much stronger. So, so Europe has been good, except for, I would say, in terms of pushing the international debate as a block. Europe always goes in really strong on human rights and on harm reduction, and then they all start squabbling amongst each other and kind of fall apart as a block. So I'm delighted that Britain is leaving the European Union because they really can't get their act together. I'm kidding, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, on the point of decriminalization, again, we've talked about this a lot already. Um, this is an excellent report, which has recently been updated, and I think it's great reading from colleagues at an organization called Release in the UK. And what they've shown is in this report is that decriminalization is not a new policy option, in fact. It's not some newfangled thing. Um, it's been going on for a long time. Actually, a few countries never criminalized the use of drugs. And while other countries have enacted decriminalization as far back as the 70s. Um, and so really, they're calling it, you know, um, and sorry, and they also they show that there's been quite a wave over the last 10 to 12 years of increasing numbers of governments enacting some form of decriminalization. So around 30 countries around the world have some kind of form of, of decriminalization. Latin America really has been at the forefront of the calls um, for reform. In fact, the last ANGAS I mentioned in 1998 was called for by Mexico. And that call was a result of frustration from the Latin American countries that source and transit countries bear the, at that time, and I think they still do to an extent, bear the highest cost of fighting the drug trade. And Mexico argued that there was a lack of balance between supply reduction and demand reduction. So for example, that the US was not doing enough to control demand. Um, also, you know, somewhat problematic framing, but they did have a valid argument in terms of there being so much pressure on them to try and stem the drug trade and too much emphasis on supply reduction. So uh, Latin America has always been really important and, and some other important initiatives 
Ecuador actually made a move to pardon um, drug couriers who were imprisoned in 2008 and 2009. There's been a rollback in Ecuador, unfortunately, on drug policies again more recently, but one step forward, two steps back. Um, there was also, and this was the precursor to the UNGAS, the Organization of American States did a really good study that was called for by the President of Colombia in 2012 called the Scenarios Report, where actually they listed out a scenario both for decriminalization and for legal regulation of drugs and you know what the world would look like or what Latin America would look like with these policy options. And then, of course, in terms of the UNGAS, it was actually Mexico, Colombia, and Guatemala who asked for this UNGAS in 2016. It probably would have happened in 2019, but they wanted to bring it forward. They felt that the issue was urgent. You can see the quote there. This is the Colombian government at the General Assembly in 2012 saying, revising the approach to drugs maintained so far by the international com community can no longer be postponed. So they, there was a real sense of urgency at the time. There's many can medical cannabis um, initiatives across the region, and also some other important initiatives looking at you know, revising sentencing frameworks, making them more proportionate, and looking at alternatives to incarceration in many countries in the region. They also face a mass incarceration issue across the region in Latin America also. Some national initiatives, I already mentioned Bolivia, which I think is, was the first kind of really big challenge to the UN treaty regime that I explained. So actually in 2009, they asked for an amendment to the treaty regime. It was President Evo Morales. He's actually from the indigenous community in, in Bolivia. He felt that actually the way that the coca leaf is named in the 1961 convention and the um, requirement to end coca leaf chewing globally was a racist and culturally imperialistic um, sort of uh, yeah, um, problem that, that he wanted to address. Um, actually, it was that amendment was rejected, so then Bolivia decided to do the next thing, which was to withdraw from the 1961 convention and re-adhere with a reservation around the coca leaf to allow coca chewing in Bolivia without being in violation of the drug control system. But they're going one step further now. They're really trying to push the idea of coca leaf, not, not cocaine, and open export markets for, for coca leaf products. Um, the, the one, we've already talked about this a lot today, but Uruguay was the first country, a very small country of only three million people, but you know, wanted to go, what was one of the countries to go first, and what well, is the first country, sorry, to move forward with regulating cannabis. It's taken them a while to get going, as you can see, the legislation passed in 2000, 2013, and 2017, they're actually gonna begin the state-controlled production. So it's a state monopoly in Uruguay, there's no advertising, quite stri strict restrictions on the commercial side. Um, which is a model, I think, that, that merits other countries looking closely at. And just to highlight, again, you know, I think in terms of the international drug control regime, small countries have gone first. Small countries have challenged the regime. The Netherlands, the you know, Portuguese example, and here's Uruguay as well. So I say that because New Zealand is a small country and also could you know, kind of have a more revolutionary spirit around breaking through. Um, I'm not going to talk about this in detail. Obviously, you've heard from um, Alison and Anne around what's happened in the US and also in Canada. I mean, just to say, you know, now, as I understand it, one in five US citizens now live in a jurisdiction where cannabis is legal. So it's really across the country and it does present a huge challenge to, to the global regime. And Canada's important. We are all looking at Canada, it's a G7 country, it's important what Canada does next on this issue. Now to Asia, very complicated mixed bag, as you may be aware. There was a strong history of traditional use in Asia, specifically of cannabis and of opium, but now in many countries that's criminalized. Um, because of the, the imposition of the international regime. And actually, when the regime was set up and they were negotiating the treaties, countries from the region, like 
Burma, like India, they really asked questions about whether opium really needed to be brought under international control and they tried to resist it. But it feels like now, apart from India, where there is still some traditional use of opium allowed, but in general, they've kind of really swallowed this very repressive approach to drugs that I feel like is a Western cultural imposition. Um, they've, there is some advances in harm reduction in some countries of the region, but it's pretty slow. Um, there's the widespread use of compulsory drug detention for drug users, so as a form of treatment, but it really isn't treatment at all. People are put into detention camps, they're either work camps or military camps. And it's incredibly problematic from a human rights perspective. Um, they just issued an ASEAN, so the Association of Southeast Asian Nations came up with a new work plan where they reaffirmed their goal of a drug-free ASEAN. Um, of course, what's going on in the Philippines is incredibly troubling and a very serious human rights um, issue. More than 8,000 extrajudicial killings have been carried out in the last year for people implicated in being involved in the drug trade in some way or of using drugs. And the government has, the, sorry, the president himself has incited those killings and, and supports them. Um, so you've got the Philippines on the one hand, and, but there are some small glimmers of hope in Southeast Asia as well. So Thailand um, actually has um, enacted a drug law reform process and actually pushed through some reforms in January of this year for more proportionate sentencing. They removed mandatory minimums, and there is a debate around decriminalization and also around medical cannabis, which is amazing for Thailand. So it is important to support that kind of discussion that's going on and a similar discussion on a smaller level in Myanmar around reform and sub greater support for harm reduction programs. Needle and syringe programs were illegal in the law in Myanmar, so that's, that's gonna change. So yeah, just again on the Philippines, I mean, this is Duterte actually said this. Um, it's pretty shocking and, um, you know, just going back in terms of asking the people what they might think on a human rights issue, President Duterte still has 80% approval ratings in the Philippines, despite carrying out this pretty horrific war on drugs. So, where are we after the young gas? Firstly, I'm going to show you a very short three-minute clip, um, which we made following the young gas for a campaign that we're involved in called, called Support Don't Punish, which you may have heard of. But the reason we made this video, firstly, so that you can see what happened at the young gas in three minutes without ever having been there, but also just because as I sat in those rooms in New York, I just couldn't, yeah, it was just, you know, so shocking to me how the governments just constantly contradicted each other on the issue of drugs. The views were so divergent, the consensus was so over, and yet they produced a document at the end that they called the New Global Consensus. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's also a little bit of fun. And Peter Dunn is featured, I believe. So it's... <laughs> So you saved yourself a visit to New York. And to be honest, for those of us who were there as civil society, we couldn't get into the building half the time anyway. It was an absolute nightmare. So um, yeah, I'm actually glad we produced that, uh, that footage. But you can see there, I mean, really, how much disagreement there really is, you know, in terms of the way to move forward and, and the approach. Sorry, I'm really conscious I'm over time. <laughs> um, so. You know, following the young gas, though, I'll say, as civil society advocates, our feelings were quite mixed. You know, we were disappointed with the outcome document because there were certain aspects of the, you know, things that we didn't get through that we would have liked to have gotten through. So, you know, we really didn't want them to reaffirm the idea of a drug-free world. And we really wanted them to acknowledge the failure and the damage. And unfortunately, they reaffirmed a society, that, you know, the need for a society free of drug abuse. Um, and they also didn't acknowledge the failure to, to, you know, to meet these targets or to eliminate or eradicate the drug trade, which are actually targets, global targets that still exist in the 2009 Political Declaration and Action Plan on Drugs, a 10-year plan which ends in 2019, which is actually the next big moment when there will be another UN debate on this issue. Um, so it was disappointing, but... Um, actually, what was interesting was that we were disappointed at the beginning, 
the countries that really adopted the UNGAS outcome document wholeheartedly were Russia, China, Pakistan, and I think that's also where our skepticism came from. You know, these countries are very problematic in terms of their adherence to a very repressive approach. And obviously the countries who were questioning the outcome document were, you know, the good guys of, of progress and human rights, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Germany, you know, other countries in the European Union. But over time, and this is what's happened in the international debate, those countries who are more repressive have been basically trying to push the UNGAS outcome aside. They don't like it. To them, I think it does actually resent, represent progress that they don't want to accept. It's much stronger on human rights. It's the strongest human rights language we've ever gotten through at the international level. It has really important language around proportionality of sentences, an issue I mentioned before. There was no agreed UN language on that issue previously. It specifically mentions needle and syringe programs, opiate substitution treatment, and also overdose prevention in the form of naloxone. That's important also. So I feel like actually the UNGAS was a success and does represent a paradigm shift especially given this resistance now from the status quo countries, and it makes it ever more important then to embed the young gas outcomes and the progress that, that you know, is within it. And yet, as I mentioned, in addition to the outcome document, we have the country statements. Many of them were very progressive, as you saw. Civil society voices were strong and diverse. Um, I think Tuare was there as one of the civil society speakers, spoke very eloquently at the end. Um, actually, the civil society speakers were the, were the stars of the young gas, really. And it's an important basis to work for working towards the 2019 moment that I mentioned. So the key outcomes, much more health, development, orientated drug control policies implemented in line with human rights obligations. And that link with human rights, again, is really, really important and coming out ever more strongly. What we call more system-wide coherence, that's simply just that more UN agencies, not just the drug control agencies, but the human rights agencies, the health agencies, the development agencies, also came to the table during the UNGAS, made strong statements in favor of reform, and all the agencies supported decriminalization, except for, guess which one? The UN Office on Drugs and Crime. I mean, they do support it, but they couldn't explicitly say decriminalization, unfortunately, and we're, we're continuing to push there. The issue of access to controlled medicines that I mentioned, um, there's really strong language around that and a specific pillar on that, in fact. And also aligning drug control objectives with the sustainable development goals that were agreed in 2015, which are important global goals for human development, and trying to understand the links between if, you know, how drug control, as it's currently constructed, will undermine the achievement of these important goals. Just very briefly, not going to take you through this either, but previously drug control at the international level was structured around three pillars, demand reduction, supply reduction, and international cooperation. The UNGAS broke out of that. We got rid of that three-pillar structure, and we have the seven pillars now. And the most important thing about this, as you can see, number four, a specific pillar on human rights. And that is, again, a huge step forward. And also, um, this is the new UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. He's from Portugal. He took office in April of this year. And this is an incredible statement that he made on the 26th of June, which is also the UN Day Against Illicit Drug Trafficking and Drug Abuse. Normally, countries have celebrated the war on drugs on this day, including China actually executing drug traffickers in public on the 26th of June to celebrate UN Drugs Day. And the fact that Guterres came out and made this statement um, in his first six months on this issue is important. And I underlined, you know, the, its consequences for human rights at the end, because what he's doing there is he's making it very clear that the UN human rights system now has to take up this issue and start paying attention to this issue. So this is, again, an opportunity to really embed the human rights dimension. So finally, the opportunities towards the road to 2019. Again, the, the, the seven themes, embedding that and capitalizing on that progress around you know, the human rights development, criminal justice progress that we've made. 
the stronger link to the sustainable development goals. These, you know, the sustainable development goals are very important to governments. They're discussing that all the time and they've actually got a big meeting in New York this week or next week on where they are and these achievements. So linking the drugs issue to the sustainable development goals is an important advocacy objective. Um, in 2019, there will be a high level meeting in Vienna where they will discuss the last 10 years since they had their 2009 political declaration and action plan where they have these, you know, to eliminate or significantly reduce the global drug trade. They, I don't think there will be a genuine evaluation and also some of the more progressive governments are saying they will not reaffirm drug-free targets in 2019, which I think is incredibly important. And I mean, what are they going to say? The, the, UN, the UNODC came out with their World Drug Report last week on World Drugs Day, or actually it was the 22nd of June, and in that report they literally say, this is a quote, the drug market is thriving. So how can they you know, reconcile that with the idea that they're making any progress on their targets of significant reduction or elimination. Um, the other opportunity is around identifying new metrics and indicators for measuring the impact of drug control. So Alison mentioned this first thing this morning. What are the objectives? Are we trying to reduce the drug market or are we trying to reduce the harm? And at the moment, all the indicators that we have, official indicators in most countries and at the UN level, is about reducing the scale of the market. Well, we know how that's going. So really, we're trying to push for new metrics and indicators that look at reducing the scale of the harm. And, sorry, I'm, I'm done, I'm done. This is it, my last slide. And finally, legal regulation, accelerating those moves. Um, as we've discussed already. So, yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you.